They say you're only born with two fears, loud noises and the fear of falling. The rest of your fears are something that you've learned to fear over the course of your life. While some people are scared of spiders, some people are scared of the dark, some people have an intense phobia of the sea, known as thalassophobia. It's defined by a persistent and intense fear of deep bodies of water, such as the sea, oceans, pools, or lakes. It's that sinking feeling you get when you're swimming in the ocean and you look down to see an endless pit of nothing below you. The vastness of the sea just makes you feel so tiny. But hey folks, my name's Ryan from Tragedy Tales, and this week we're diving right back into five horrors on the waves, ranging from the terrible duck boat tragedy to the doomed voyage of the Princess of the Stars. As always, let's get right into it. Did you know that the odds of a shark attack are 1 in 3.7 million? Contrary to what a lot of people think, shark attacks are pretty rare. They'd much rather take on prey that they're used to hunting. But when a shark's hungry, they'll take a bite out of pretty much anything. Boats, surfboards, and sometimes your legs. While the famous great white shark have killed the most on record, with 52 recorded fatalities, Bull sharks have taken the lives of at least 25 people. They are well known for their large size, aggressive nature, and unpredictable behavior. If you see one while you're scuba diving, it's best to steer clear. However, sometimes sharks can take you by surprise, and this video is a perfect example of that. The video begins in December of 2016 in North Queensland, Australia. That fateful day, a spearfisher and diver on YouTube by the name of Kendrick811 set out with a group of friends to do some spearfishing just off the Great Barrier Reef. That fateful day, the group hopped on a boat and got 50 kilometers away from the shore. Here, they donned their diving gear and jumped into the clear waters, hoping to catch some nice big fish to take home. Then, this video was recorded. It shows Kendrick in the waters, looking around, searching for fish to spear. When all of a sudden, a large bull shark comes into view. Within seconds, it was at his feet. And with not even enough time to pull the trigger, the bull shark reached him and opened his mouth. Moments before it was about to strike, the shark suddenly impaled itself on his spear gun. Wanting to avoid it coming back for seconds, Kendrick retreated to his boat, leaving his precious spear gun impaled in its head. That day, while he was annoyed he'd lost his equipment, he was very grateful to be alive. If he'd noticed even a second later, or if it was at a slightly different angle, it would have at least bitten off his entire arm in the process. Many people praised him for his calm approach to this situation, but some people condemned him for killing an animal even though it was clearly in self-defense, some even sending him death threats. It was his life or the sharks, in my opinion. Shark experts have watched this video and say that this behavior is just very unusual. Perhaps it was being territorial. Regardless, this encounter is just one in a million and to capture it on video is another achievement in itself. While Kendrick's spearfishing trip ended prematurely that year, this encounter didn't stop him from re-entering the waters, returning to spearfishing the following year. When you embark on a tour, be it a canyon expedition, a hot air balloon voyage, or perhaps a private boat excursion, your foremost expectation is safety. You trust that the operators are experienced and cautious. Unfortunately, in this case, that trust was misplaced. This tragic tale begins on the evening of July the 19th, 
2018, on the Table Rock Lake in the Ozarks near Branson, Missouri. On that chilly evening, 31 individuals boarded a duck boat operated by the company Ride the Ducks, anticipating a leisurely tour of the Table Rock Lake. Sadly, that day would end in disaster. For a bit of context, Ride the Ducks was a company specializing in amphibious tours, originating from post-World War II surplus vehicles. These duck boats were converted into water touring vessels, starting with rides on the Minnesota River before expanding to major tourist destinations all across the United States. Hey Tony, what's with this Ride the Ducks thing? Hey Frankie, you know, you gotta get out more often. It's one of the best ways to see Seattle by land and sea. Yeah, it's amphibious. What's that mean? The party on wheels! It was a kick, they were great, I loved it. It's the best time I've ever had. It was the best time. To maximize profits, the specific duck boats involved in this incident were extensively modified to accommodate more passengers than originally intended. This alteration disrupted the boat's balance when at full capacity. While there had been previous fatal incidents involving these duck boats before, none were as devastating as this one. Now I know this is a lake, but in this series we cover anything that's on the waves. Around 11.20 on July the 19th, 2018, the National Weather Service issued a severe thunderstorm watch for Southwest Missouri, including Stone and Taney counties. This encompassed the Table Rock Lake area until 9 p.m. that evening. This forecast warned of severe thunderstorms and isolated wind gusts of 70 to 75 miles per hour. At 6.30 p.m., as severe thunderstorms approached Missouri, 31 souls boarded the stretch duck boat 7 which was on its fifth and final tour of the day. Boarding and exiting the boat was facilitated by unique ladders that could be raised or lowered, making it somewhat challenging to leave once you were on board. After running through some safety checks, they set off from the Ride the Ducks facility. They then had a brief drive to the water before submerging into the lake at approximately 7 p.m. As they waded in, the waves at this point were turbulent. The skies were overcast, but the captain assured them that the conditions were not that severe. Although life jackets were provided for each passenger, they were told that they wouldn't need them. As Duck Boat 7 entered the water, it was followed by Duck Boat 54, also carrying around 30 passengers. Soon after leaving, the waves grew rougher and rougher. This caused a steady unease amongst the passengers. Just 15 minutes after getting onto the water, the storm struck Table Rock Lake with unrelenting force, delivering hurricane winds of up to 60 miles an hour and generating waves as high as five feet. Pretty rough to say the least. Never seen it quite this bad. Boats can't get in. Boats can't get out. Rough cookie today. These waves instantly breached the non-watertight bow hatch causing Duck Boat 7 to take on water. After water began coming in through the bow hatch, it then started coming in through the windows. Because of this, the captain then raised both spray protectors for both sides of the vessel. With these in place, it stopped the spray of the water, but they were far from waterproof. They were still allowing water to trickle in from underneath. As Duck Boat 7 slowed to a crawl, it continued to fill with water. It filled more rapidly than anyone could have anticipated. And when people began looking for an exit, unfortunately, due to the artificial roof and the entry ladder, and paired with the fact that the spray guards were now in place, escaping was far from simple. At four minutes past seven, the flood alarms sounded on both Duck Boat 7 and 54. This alert caused them both to race to the shore, but by the time Duck Boat 54 reached land, Duck Boat 7 had scarcely moved. The first 911 call came in at 7.09, in a state of frantic urgency. The caller reported a sinking duck boat on Table Rock Lake, pleading for immediate assistance. As this call was going on, this video is captured from a stationary showboat. 
it showed Duck Boat 54 slowly overtaking the sinking Duck Boat 7. In the video, you can see how low the front of the vessel had now dipped, enduring substantial waves. Just minutes after this video was recorded, Dark Boat 7 tilted to one side and the captain released one side of the roof. However, since he was wearing a life jacket, as he did this, it yanked him from the wheel before he could release the other side. Chaos unfolded as the entire vessel sank beneath the waves, descending to the lake's bed with several passengers trapped inside. Western units need a water rescue. We'll be north of the showboat. We'll be a duck that has capsized. We have approximately 30 individuals in the water. Emergency services arrived quickly, but it was clear that many had already died. Throughout the night, Divers retrieved passengers from the lake's depths. Some were found within the submerged boat, others were found drifting on the surface, and others were found trapped on the lake's bed. After 31 on board, only 14 would survive, leaving 17 deceased. Ethan, it's unimaginable for any of us as parents. 17 lives gone. The youngest, a one-year-old baby. The oldest, a 70-year-old grandparent. Families here on vacation setting out on beautiful Table Rock Lake when the weather, as we know, took a terrible turn. Tragically, nine out of those who were lost were from one family. While the other dock boat tours continued to operate using appropriate vessels, those employed using these modified World War II vehicles, specifically operated by Ride the Docks, ceased operations immediately following this tragedy. The Branson location was later repurposed into a laser tag and children's entertainment facility. But the surrounding community then and now remains shaken by this event. It was painfully clear that this ordeal could have been entirely averted, given that the storm warning was issued earlier in the day and the fact that it wouldn't have even sunk if extensive modifications had not been made to the vessels. A few months after this incident, in November of 2019, the National Transportation Safety Board released a safety recommendation report asserting that the accident was foreseeable 
and preventable. It said in this report that these vessels were never meant for commercial use, let alone extensive modification to accommodate more passengers. They contended that if proper actions had been taken by the Coast Guard to warn the dock boat more properly, or if the vessel's operators had made correct decisions, these deaths would have not occurred. That same month, the captain of the dock boat, 54-year-old veteran Kenneth Scott McKee, along with the general manager and another manager on duty that day, faced various charges, including endangering the welfare of a child and 17 counts of involuntary manslaughter for the 17 people who lost their lives. In total, the three faced 63 felony charges. Regrettably, however, in April of 2022, all state charges against the three employees were dismissed. The judge reasoned that the unique characteristics of the boat is what led to its rapid sinking. While the staff were aware of the storm, the judge said that there was no evidence that they were aware of the storm's gust front, which is why the waves were so large. Although they evaded personal accountability, lawsuits were brought against the company that owned the Ride the Ducks brand, Ripley Entertainment, totaling $100 million. But just imagine that. You're on a boat with your family or your friends and it suddenly starts taking in water. You try to escape, but you find that you suddenly can't. You're trapped in a boat with people screaming, with water filling up to the ceiling. It's a total nightmare. But as always, I'm interested in all your thoughts below. This entry begins in India on the warm afternoon of June the 9th, 2023. On that fateful Sunday, a 32-year-old woman named Yoti Sonar, along with her husband and her three children, traveled from their home in Mumbai to visit a local beach. Now that day, the family wanted to spend some time by the water, have a picnic, and perhaps snap some photos to post online. They'd already tried to go to another beach in the local area that day, but were actually turned down due to high tide. They weren't going to let this stop them, so they decided that they'd instead go to the Bandra Bandstand, a 1.2 kilometer long walkway along the sea on the western coast of Mumbai, in the neighborhood of Bandra, located just a short drive from their home. This walkway is a hotspot for joggers and tourists eager to get a glimpse of the choppy waves, but sadly, this trip would be their last. As the family arrived at Bandra, the first thing that Yoti and her husband wanted to do was to get a photo by the waves. Yoti and her husband rushed to the water and sat upon the jagged rocks. With the Arabian Sea crashing behind them, they asked a passerby to take a photo. All captured on video, Yoti and her husband posed for a few snapshots, their children observing from a safe distance. In the video, you can see the relentless onslaught of towering waves as they sat on their rocky perch. Honestly, if I was them, the first wave would have caused me to move. However, they stayed right there, desperate to get a good photo. The couple can be seen laughing, joking, it was all fun and games, until, of course, it wasn't. As a third large wave crashed against them, it almost took them with it but they still didn't move. When the fourth wave came, it completely engulfed them both, knocking them off their balance and sweeping them from the rock. Amidst the chaos, Yoti's husband, Murkesh, tried grabbing at Yoti's sari, but he was unable to hold on. Murkesh, Yoti's husband, reached out to grab a hold of someone's hand as he was being swallowed by the sea and he barely managed to grab a hold of a hand that stopped him from being swept out with the water. Yoti, however, his beloved wife, was not so lucky. When the waves subsided, she was nowhere to be seen. The children's voices could be heard screaming out for their mummy, their pleas swallowed by the roar of the unforgiving sea. Within seconds, a family had been shattered. A desperate search and rescue ensued, 
but it was in vain. 20 hours later, Yoti's lifeless body was discovered in the water. In the aftermath, his voice heavy with grief, Murkesh recounted the tragic tale to local police, saying, I lost my balance and we both slipped. A man held me while I grabbed my wife, but she could not be saved. Upon watching the video, many criticized both of their actions that day, from sitting on the rock in the first place to not moving when the waves gave them ample warning. But the real tragedy in all of this is the fact that the children had to watch the whole ordeal, even shouting for their mother as she was being swept away. It's just a total tragedy. This incident is a harsh reminder of the brutal power of the sea. Venturing out into dangerous places for photos is just never recommended, especially at high tide. There was no wonder they got turned down from the other beach. The Mumbai Fire Brigade has urged people to be aware of the risks and to stay away from the water when it's clear the waves aren't placid. But as always, I'm interested in your thoughts below. This short but crazy video has little background, but it's believed it's filmed in 2021, somewhere in Alaska. Now the footage starts with a gentleman in a green wool hat, piloting a speedboat with a large wall of ice in the distance behind him. Just as the video begins, the ice behind the captain can be seen tilting backwards. A few seconds later, on the left-hand side of the screen, chunks of ice can be seen crumbling from the block before all of a sudden this happens. Like something straight out of Pacific Rim, a huge wall of water around the size of a building suddenly towers above them. It gets bigger and bigger before the underneath of the iceberg could be seen. This movement clearly displaced a large amount of water, sending a huge wave racing towards them at breakneck pace. It was a sudden iceberg tsunami. With quick reflexes, the pair put the engine on full speed and got the hell out of there, escaping by the skin of their teeth. The pair were of course shaken up, but happy to be alive. If they had been any closer to that iceberg, their small boat would have almost certainly been swabbed by the waves and dragged under the water. Being that it's icy cold and it looks like they're in the middle of nowhere, they'd be dead in minutes. Replaying the clip, it looks like this was either caused by a piece of the iceberg falling off or it could have been that the iceberg flipped over on itself. Of course, there's little info on this clip. If you've got any information down below, do let me know. The Princess of the Stars, flagship of the shipping company Sulpicia Lines, once reigned as one of the most lavish vessels in the Philippines. Originally crafted in Japan in 1984, it was soon modified to carry more cargo and passengers and in 2004, it made its way to its new permanent home in the Philippines. Sulpicia Lines was founded in September of 1973, starting with a fleet of 17 vessels, one tugboat and five barges. Originally, Sulpicia Lines catered to a niche market. However, this slowly grew and in 1988, they had a fleet of 22 passenger and cargo vessels. Sulpicia Lines had a market share of 20% of the domestic sea traffic in the Philippines. They were huge. From places near or far away To places where you need to be In comfort we'll take you on your way Across the open sea From Quality, 
But in 2004, when the Princess of the Stars joined Sulpicia Lines, this absolutely colossal 193 meter or 633 foot vessel claimed the title of the largest passenger ferry to ever grace Philippine waters. Its sheer size drew the eyes of the public, passengers and even rival companies, setting it apart from the other ferries of its time. Sadly, this vessel would have a tragic destiny. On the ill-fated evening of June the 20th, 2008, at 8.04 p.m., the Princess of the Stars set sail from Manila to Cebu, carrying approximately 870 people, including 120 staff and crew. They left the port that evening, completely ignoring a large storm warning that had been raised earlier in the day over Manila due to Typhoon Fengshen, a Category 2 storm. The Philippine Coast Guard greenlit the Princess of the Stars voyage, reasoning that its size could brave the typhoon's outer fringes. The journey to Cebu City pressed on. Yet, that evening, Feng Shen would shift its course and put the ferry in grave jeopardy. At 11.30 p.m., just a few hours after they'd left the port, the Coast Guard issued a directive prohibiting all types of ships from sailing. But the ferry was now well on its course. They ignored this warning. Throughout the night, the ship braved the storm. But by 6.30 a.m. on June the 21st, 2008, Pier 12 in Manila urged the ship to come back and seek refuge, actively directing them to abandon their course and come back to the port. But alas, it was too late. The Princess of the Stars was already hurtling straight towards the storm. There was no way to turn around. At 11.30 a.m. that morning, the Princess of the Stars alerted Sulpicia Lines to say that they had encountered some engine trouble and that they had grounded themselves near San Fernando. However, just an hour later, at 12.30 p.m., a distress call was sent out saying that they needed help. This reached the Navy, which instantly prompted a rescue mission. This call for help was far too late. Shortly thereafter, the ship tilted severely, prompting the captain to order an abandonment. The ferry tilted further and further and further until it eventually succumbed, capsizing onto its starboard side. Now on its starboard side, the ship slowly sank into the depths. Efforts by the Navy to mount a rescue were thwarted by intense waves, torrential rain and gusty winds. They were in a literal typhoon. The mayor of San Fernando dispatched a personal speedboat, but when they got there, they confirmed that the ferry had a breach in the hull and it was now partially submerged. Several bodies were found in the close proximity, but subsequent reports clarified that the breach in the hull was in fact the ship's bow thruster. It wasn't damaged at all as recounted by four survivors who managed to reach the nearby island by just swimming to safety. They detailed that the Princess of the Stars did not suffer any malfunction that day. They said that they had instead encountered heavy turbulent seas and at 11.30 a.m. passengers were instructed to don life jackets and then 15 minutes later, the captain ordered an evacuation. Only some were lucky enough to make it onto the few life rafts that were there. And according to the survivors, the crew prioritized their own safety over assisting the passengers. When the Philippine Coast Guard got there, more than 24 hours later, a desolate scene greeted them. The ship was now completely overturned, its hull facing the sky. There were no signs of life. They combed the area for bodies, but none were found. Those who were killed were either trapped within the vessel had been eaten by sharks or drifted away with the currents. By June the 23rd, the Coast Guard and the Philippine Navy had recovered four bodies from the site. Another 35 bodies and 40 survivors washed ashore. However, it's likely that these bodies were not only from the Princess of the Stars, but also from another vessel that capsized during the typhoon. Navy divers who entered the vessel found no survivors. They found 15 bodies in the ship's dining area and two more in the bridge. The interior of the ferry was so dark 
that it was impossible to ascertain how many more lay dead within. Just imagining that sight of swimming into a sunken vessel of pitch black, full of the dead, it just oh, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Sadly, due to inadequate counting, the death toll was inaccurately reported. In total, a devastating 814 people perished or had gone missing, leaving only 56 people alive, an absolutely heart-wrenching loss. The focus then shifted on who was to blame and the recovery of the deceased. On June the 27th, 2008, recovery operations were halted when recovery teams discovered 10,000 kilograms of hazardous pesticide on board. This shipment should have never been on the passenger vessel, just it being there was breaching several safety regulations, but this would stop the recovery for a good four months. Over four months later, once all the dangerous chemicals and the fuel were removed from the ship, the search for the bodies could now be commenced. From October the 27th to November the 10th, divers recovered 199 bodies trapped from decks A to C. Only 350 bodies were retrieved, with the rest presumed to be trapped within the vessel or lost at sea. Due to their prolonged submersion, most of the recovered bodies had detached limbs or were beyond identification. This meant they had to use DNA to tell who they even were. In a report dated August the 25th, 2008, submitted to the Maritime Industry of Authority, the Philippines Board of Marine Inquiry held Sulpicia Lines and its captain accountable for the tragedy. The BMI recommended that the authority consider suspending Sulpicia Lines' Certificate of Public Convenience and prosecute them for their role in the sinking. The final report attributed the disaster to human error and concluded that the ship's missing and presumed dead captain miscalculated the risk of continuing the trip to Cebu despite the stormy weather. In May of 2010, the wreck of the Princess of the Stars was cut in half and towed into shallower waters where divers could safely conduct further searches. While searching, an additional 47 skeletons were recovered. In January of 2015, almost seven years after the sinking, the Maritime Industry Authority of the Philippines decided that they would revoke the Sulpicia Lines Company Certificate of Public Convenience, meaning that they could no longer carry passengers and now only focus on cargo. Sulpicia Lines has now been rebranded to the Philippine Span Asia Carrier Corporation. They continue to be one of Philippines' largest shipping container companies However, the remaining ferry ships were each taken to ferry breakers and stripped for parts, ensuring that Sulpicia will never take passengers again. But what a total, avoidable and terrible tragedy. May the souls in this entry and this video rest in peace. But that was an absolutely crazy video. First of all, the clip of the couple being swept away just made me sad. The kids were watching and it didn't have a happy ending. The iceberg tsunami video, I didn't even know was a thing until I researched it. That's another fear unlocked. And the duck boat tragedy, the thought of being stuck in a vessel as it quickly fills up with water, knowing that there isn't an escape, it just doesn't bear thinking about. But as always, I'm interested in all your thoughts below. Remember, I do try and read every single comment, even if I can't necessarily reply. But just before I go, if you're into true horror content such as this, go down there and smash that subscribe button. And while you're down there, tap that notification bell to be alerted at when I release content such as this. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.